Hello friends, looking at current affairs for 27th June, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 13, we will look at them in detail. The first one, centre to consider proposal for outright sale of Air India. So cabinet, union cabinet is considering what should be done with Air India as we have discussed this earlier too, Air India sale, what steps would be taken would is mean in news on 23rd june to be specific we have completely discussed in detail about air india its debt burden and you know how it can be taken care of so again proposals have been made formulated by department of investment and public asset management DIPAM, under ministry of finance so these three options have been put forth before the cabinet to decide what should be done so first option is that there should be 100 percent sell off of air india Second is 74% sell-off or third is 51% sell-off means retaining 49%. So that is 51% sell-off. So you know this is retaining. So means 51% will sold off. So out of these three options now union cabinet will decide what should be done. So actually the finance ministry Niti Aayog are in favor of complete sell-off. But the, we have seen in on 23rd June 2 that civil aviation ministry wants that government should remain a stakeholder. So this we will see what will be the cabinet's decision presently to will be coming in news. So you should be aware of this. This has been prominently in news. I have said this earlier too. It has been completely discussed in detail in economic survey also. So it is an important issue. So you should know about it. So how now what would how would it be gone ahead with too is that the cabinet is also considering that a uh, because this is a suggestion that a special purpose vehicle should be established. So all the uh, Air India's liabilities would be taken up by this special purpose vehicle SPV which will have a portion of the non-aircraft debt of Air India. Also its subsidiaries would be under it and real estate assets would be under it. So this is a special purpose vehicle being proposed. So you can see the debt. There is two aspects to it. Aircraft debt and non-aircraft debt. So out of the complete debt which Air India has presently around 52,000 crores. Out of this aircraft loan is 22,000 crores. And non-aircraft loan is remaining. So that is 30,000 crores. So this 30,000 is called working capital loan or non-aircraft loan. So out of this non-aircraft loan, working capital loan, a part of it. Say 25% of it would be taken over by the SPV. So this is a proposal and the income garnered through sale of assets and subsidiaries will be sufficient to meet the liability of this working capital loan which SPV would take care of. So that is why it will be handed over this subsidiaries also and the real estate as such too. So real estates and subsidiaries are mentioned here. There are four wholly owned subsidiaries of Air India. You can see they are mentioned here. And then there is also Hotel Corporation of India, which is a subsidiary of Air India. And also it has a joint venture in SX. So this is what are the subsidiary status of Air India. Plus the real estate, it has some prominent real estates too, like a building at Nariman Point, which is a, you know, which is a prominent location, a prime location in Mumbai. So this is there. Plus then there is another old airport building in all airport in Santa Cruz in Mumbai. Then there is freehold land in Chennai. Also freehold land in Hyderabad. There are buildings in Hyderabad it owns. Also an office in Connaught Place. So all these are its assets. You don't need to remember all the assets but this is just to give you an idea that it has prominent assets but then many of these assets are mortgaged. So when they took loans from the bank they have been kept as securities with the banks for the loans. So this is also there. So we will see how this puts in, comes into effect. SPV is also being considered by the cabinet for approval. So once it is approved again it will be in news. So here is the detail about the mounting debts of Air India too. You can see what we just discussed aircraft loan and working capital loan. Then next news item is Gulmar cable car crash and act of God official. So in Gulmarg in Jammu and Kashmir, we saw a tragic cable car crash took place in which seven people died, four from a family in Delhi, based in Delhi and also three local youths. So this, after this incident, the report which is coming forth, the officials here are saying that the, all these prerequisite safety norms were followed and this cable car crash was an act of God. So this is the statement coming forth which is shocking. Then next news item is Kasturi Rangan to head education committee. 
So this is Mr. K. Kasturi Rangan, who was the former head of ISRO2. He is a, an eminent scientist, a Padma Vibhushan awardee, and he has presently been appointed the chairman of a committee which will prepare the final draft of the national education policy. Already there was a committee which was established for education reforms, and this was TSR Subramaniam Committee. So it had submitted its report in 2015 and these committee's recommendations will also be taken into consideration by Mr. Kasturi Rangan's committee to prepare the final draft. So it has a chairman and eight members which will look into this uh, national education policy final draft. So here the details are given, also suggestions coming from various state level officials, even on my GOV platforms, various views which have been given by people online, all would be considered, MPs which have given their views in writing will be considered by this committee. So, what committee has already been set up and its major recommendations, we'll just discuss. So, this is TSR Subramaniam Committee. It was set up in 2015. It gave its report in May 2015 as well. And the key recommendations which it gave are mentioned here. So, one, it should, there, he suggested that there should be an Indian education service, an All India service as such. So, All India service means they are, appoint, they are recruited by the center, but they are functioning in the states all over. So, to have the complete hold over the education sector too, there should be these Indian education service officers as all India service officers as which will be working with the HRD ministry in various states on the CADA basis. So, they will be given state cadres and they would be functioning. So, this is one suggestion given by TSR Subramaniam committee. The other one is at least 6% of GDP should be provided for, for the education sector. So, India's education sector expenditure is quite low. We need to invest more in education. So, this is there. Then third suggestion is that there should be a mini minimum eligibility condition that 50% marks at graduation level are essential for entry to existing B. Ed. courses. So, B. Ed. courses uh, should be further strengthened. There should be a minimum eligibility condition too. And then teachers' entrance test should be conducted. They should be made compulsory for recruiting all teachers. Then uh, fourth suggestion is that there should be certification procedure for teachers in government and private schools. So this should be made mandatory. And there should be a provision for renewal every 10 years too. So then there is an independent external testing of teachers also. So to improve education sector. Then preschool education for children in the age group of 4 to 5 years should be declared as a right. And it should be implemented as such. Then no detention policy is also favored by this committee's report and it says it should be continued for children up to class 6, class 5, means they up to their, up to their 11 years of age, right. Then one more suggestion is that on-demand board exams should be there. So on-demand board exams means only when those who are want to like. So these board exams would be less stressful and the students and parents can have the flexibility as such too. So this is there. Then another is midday meal scheme. So this midday meal program should be extended to secondary schools as well. Presently it functions for primary schools. And then UGC Act, University Grants Commission. So it says University, University Grants Commission should be revamped. It should be made leaner and thinner and should be given the role of specifically of dispersal of scholarships and fellowships. So, it's a grants commission. So, these scholarship fellowships should be granted by it. So, there should be a separate law which would be formulated for management of higher education. So, UGC Act can be allowed to be lapsed. So, there should be a new act for UGC. That is a suggestion given for it. And finally, it is asking for even top 200 foreign universities. They should be allowed to open campuses in India and give the same degree which they are, you know, which is acceptable in the home country of the said university. So, such degrees can be brought, can be acquired by Indian students in India and they are valid in their home countries as well. So, these were the suggestions given by ASR Subramaniam Committee. And now the Kasturi Rangan Committee is going to prepare the final draft of national education policy, the new education policy. So this, such things, committee after committee have been there. A president is also there. Mr. Kasturi Rangan also set, headed a committee which was set up on Western Ghats. So you should be able to recollect that also. There's a Kasturi Rangan, same person, is Rochi. He has also headed a committee on Western Ghats and this was also after a committee had already been set up and had given its recommendations. So those recommendations were too stringent and could not be acceptable because it had called for entire Western Ghats to be declared as a protected area. 
So, of course, it had created a furor in many states, the states through in which Western Ghats lie, and also at the central level. So, then finally, a new committee was established, headed by Mr. Kasturi Kanga. So, former committee was Madhav Ghatkil Committee on Western Ghats. So, here again, we have Kesar Subnamanyam Committee on Education Reforms, and now another committee headed by Mr. K. Kasturi Ranga on Education Reforms, which will look into all these suggestions too. Then next is, then the next news item is school site entry level clause to deny RT. So this is a specific case of a daily wager from Madurai who applied for his son's admission under Right to Education Act. So this an online system was introduced by Tamil Nadu government here from 2017 onwards. So when this application came forth, it was shortlisted and the son was selected through the lottery system in a school in the region but now after that the school has denied admission to this boy because he is five years old and is overage for lower kg for which admission as such is done and he, the parents say that we don't want admission in lower kg his age appropriate class would be class one so we want admission in class one but then the school says no we will not be giving an, ad, uh, admission in class one because this rte application or right to education is applicable only for entry level classes. So this is a dilemma which has been faced by these parents here. A daily wager uh, you know, couple here as such which we see. So what is this right to education act and what are the contentions here? So actually right to education act provides for free and compulsory education from 6 to 14 years of age. And also in the private schools, 25% of the seats should be reserved for underprivileged people in the locality. So this provision is already there in right to education and schools are supposed to enroll there. The fees would be taken care of by the, you know, provided for by the government. So what we see is that schools as they are saying entry level if at lower KG level they have already enrolled 25% then of course those same students would be going to higher classes and they may not have vacancies. If they have vacancies then they have to notify and also take admissions there. So that is another aspect but then here a point highlighted is that schools generally start from lower kg or even nursery but then these daily wagers they generally don't send their children at such young age. They generally send them later after five years of age. So this is a dilemma in this present case which they are facing. So this uh, is uh, being taken up by a uh, right, right, right to education activist here too. Then the next news item is Chinese troops transgress Sikkim sector in Doka area. So this is regarding Sikkim region here you can see. So Sikkim state of India is clubbed between Nepal and Bhutan and on the northern side you have Tibet. And this here, this region is called Chumbi Valley too. This V-shaped region which you see here. So this is the Nathula Pass here too and the region which we are talking of presently is Dokala area. So this Dokala is also close there. Also we have seen the Chinese troops, they have been stopping the pilgrims here too. Because now this is the route which is used for Kailash Mansarovar Yatra too. So the Kailash mountain which is considered sacred in Hinduism and the Mansarovar. The lake here which is a source of various rivers as well. So this Kailash Mansarovar Yatra is, is an annual pilgrimage which is done and you... Presently, the route which is used is from Sikkim, Nathula Pass. They go through Tibet and reach Kailash Mansarovar. It is located in Tibet. So, here we are seeing that Chinese soldiers are also stopping these pilgrims. So, this is a point of concern raised and they have destroyed bunkers. The makeshift bunkers which armed forces, the Indian army had in this region. And two of them have been destroyed by the Chinese troops. So, this is the situation, the escalation of tension here in Sikkim which has been seen in the last few days. So the boundary between India and China is also known as line of actual control, LAC. So the, even presently because of this escalation of tensions, even a human chain as such was formed across the LOC so that the People's Liberation Army, this is the name for the army of China, they, they are sent back. So this is there. Earlier too such a transgression was done in November 2008 in Sikkim here. Uh, earlier to make Indian army bunkers were destroyed and now again in 2017 we are seeing a similar scope. Again another important aspect here is that you should know about the Kailash Mansarovar Yatra too and this is not only prominent or not only you know sacred for the Hindus but also for Jains, Buddhists and other religions. So this has been discussed here the Bond religion is the third one. 
so for hindus mount kailash is considered as the abode of lord shiva for buddhists it is considered as the place where lord buddha was conceived for jains it is considered as astapada the, the actually the mount which is next to mount kailash is the place where the first tirthankara rishabnath he attained moksha so the first tirthankara was rishabnath the jains 24th tirthankara as per their belief is the last tirthankara which is lord mahavira so these are the beliefs which these religions have and the last one bond religion which is religion before buddhism a religion from tibet bond religion also believes that kailash mansarovar is the spirit, seat of all spiritual power so this is a tibet religion all four religions consider kailash mansarovar sacred then the next news item is this is showing the region where presently we are seeing the tri junction the region where sikkim means india bhutan and this tibet region of china this region is known as chumbi valley this region tri junction which means where we have seen presently escalation of conflicts then the next news item is at 399 ppm parts per million india matches the world in atmospheric carbon dioxide levels so this is regarding the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels coming from the nasa satellite the readings of the nasa satellite this is oco2 orbiting carbon observatory 2 so this satellite monitors the environment and it has revealed that some regions in india have very high carbon dioxide concentrations much higher than even 405 parts per million and 410 parts per million now what does this number signify you should know one thing the fact which is there and which has been stated by scientists that if carbon dioxide concentration in atmosphere if it goes beyond 350 means 350 parts per million means there are 350 carbon dioxide molecules per million gas molecules in the atmosphere so if 350 ppm is is breached this level is breached carbon dioxide concentration level then the environment is considered unsafe and it will result into a trap because this much amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is sufficient to trap the heat and trigger extreme climate events in the world so that is why we should not breach 350 parts per million carbon dioxide level but we have already breached it in 2015 the global average was 400 parts per million and india's is very close to it so that's what the news is that reading which has come from this orbiting carbon observatory oco2 and also other readings show that india has breached this level and it has reached the same global average that is near same so it is 399 parts per million and some regions have already breached this as highlighted here so this is the the multiple causes which are said to be the reason for these satellite images and you should know satellite imagery has been used since 1990s before that it was atmosphere observatories which are there all across in the world so these were used to measure the concentration of carbon dioxide now we have this since 1990s we have this oco2 and such satellites available satellite images available so what are the reasons for this high concentration of carbon dioxide levels in india so they are been listed here you can see so the causes are one it is stated that we do not have sufficient carbon dioxide sink means carbon dioxide needs to be absorbed you know oceans are carbon dioxide sink forests are carbon dioxide sink and you know artificially also we can have carbon dioxide sink so there is lack of carbon dioxide sinks then there is sources of carbon dioxide emissions because of forest fires biomass burning in a you know and also urban sources gases transport carbon dioxide emissions because of these in urban areas and also the neighboring regions the pollution from there also because of prevailing weather conditions the winds carry them further into a country so that is also a reason for it's a significant rise of carbon dioxide concentrations presently also we have seen this significantly in news that carbon dioxide levels increase during winters so we have seen from december november december it had been prominently in news how delhi was suffering because of pollution so it's generally heightened during the winters because even vegetation is reduced then and the prevailing wind conditions as such also result into such conditions this is there this is the image shown of carbon dioxide concentrations you can see the concentration levels and india's imagery as such then the next news item is when america first meets make in india so we are we are discussing about india us 
meet the meet of Prime Minister Narendra Modi with US President. So, what is on agenda? What is significantly, you know, prominently in news about India-US relations? One is about India-US strategic partnership. So, we have gone ahead with a strategic partnership. We have signed one of the three fundamental foundational agreements with the US. Actually, US wants us to sign all three. We have signed one of them. Now, which are these three foundational agreements spoken of? You should know about them. This was in August 2016 that India signed these, uh, this agreement called LEMOA. Right? So, this LEMOA is a facilitating agreement, logistics support agreement actually. So, uh, logistics... So, this LEMOA is Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement. So, this has been signed between India and USA in August 2016. So, this is for logistics exchange that the military will could armed forces of India and US will be given facilities for you know, logistic support. So, reciprocal provisions there means both will get from each other. So, supplies, services, etc. as such would be provided for. So, this is part of India-US defense cooperation. So, logistic support are like, you know, including during port visits, they can have port of call, during disaster relief operations, joint exercises, you know, humanitarian assistance can be supported, provided for together. And whatever services are used by the other armed forces of another country, they can be reimbursed through cash payment or reciprocity. So, this is the provision under the Logistic Exchange Memorandum of Agreement. The other two agreements which USA wants us to sign are, one is this SISMOA, Communications and Information Security Memorandum of Agreement and BECA, Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement. So, these three agreements are considered as the base for strategic partnership between USA and any other nation. So, USA wants all nations who sign these three as a strategic partners should sign these three agreements. So, Presently, you have signed only one of them and you should know logistic support agreement does not mean that we have an obligation to carry out a joint activity. So, that it does not put in any obligation. It does not establish a military base of USA and India. That is not the purpose of logistic support agreement. So, this is about India-US defense partnership, strategic partnership. Apart from that, another point on economic aspect is regarding the high tariffs which have been highlighted by US President Donald Trump. The import charges, import duties which we impose on various commodities. Famously, he has also spoken of indirectly about Harley Davidson and how 100% import duty is imposed by India. Means anybody in India imports Harley Davidson, the price doubles. So, as much as you pay for Harley Davidson, that much import duty you pay to the government. So, such high tariffs have been highlighted by US President too. The patent protection concerns are also there with respect to India that India does not provide sufficient patent protection as such. So, this is there and India's concerns are regarding cuts in visas, H1B visa cuts, restrictions imposed, fees hiked. So, these are the concerns, jobs Indians have in America. So, these are the points with respect to trade and another point which is there is regarding the deal for F-16 fighter jets. So, these F-16 fighter jets, this is economy only. Defense plus economy now. So, F-16 fighter jets are to be, you know, manufactured as such by Lock, which are manufactured by Lockheed Martin. We have discussed recently news that Reliance had had a joint venture with Lockheed Martin. So, that F-16 fighters, if they are selected, make in India will be possible as such. Through. Then another is regarding the predator zones. These predator drones will be sold by USA to India. So, this will be brought off the shelf. There is no make in India in this. Then next is regarding the 22 Predator drones. So, these will be brought off the shelf from US company that is General Atomics. There is no make in India in this. So, this is also a huge deal of around 2 to 3 billion dollars which is up on take. And with respect to nuclear technology, India-US nuclear deal has been signed during uh, George Bush. And then after that, we have not had any deal as such. The only deal which had gone ahead of NPCIL. NPCL Westinghouse deal. This is suffering presently because Westinghouse had filed for bankruptcy. So, again, there is little movement on this deal also, whether the nuclear reactors would be established under it or not. And after this, we have seen the government of India also announce that it will have its indigenously established nuclear reactors. So, that is also there. So, we will see what will be the result of this present meeting India, in India-US bilateral relations. The next is, India may ask Myanmar to end ceasefire with NSCNK. So, we have already discussed NSCNK on 25th of June. So, we have, we should know everything about NSCNK. We do not have a ceasefire agreement with them. But Myanmar, 
the nation which India blames provides safe haven to NSC and K. Nationalist Socialist Council of Nagaland, Kaplang. So this faction of NSCN is provided safe haven in Myanmar is what India believes. And it's asking Myanmar, it has a ceasefire agreement with NSCNK. So this ceasefire agreement between the two should end. Myanmar should end it because and hand over the people who are wanted from this organization to India. This is a terrorist organization, a separatist organization according to India. So they have these insurgency camps in Myanmar, but Myanmar denies that there is no such insurgency camp in its territory. Then recently we had also seen that Nagaland Home Minister was actually speaking of India also having a ceasefire agreement with NSCNK. But now this news is coming because Home Secretary will be on a visit to Myanmar and he is highlighting that I am going to go ahead and ask Myanmar to end ceasefire agreement. So ending of ceasefire agreement, ceasefire means both sides agree. That will not retaliate and attack. So if there is no ceasefire agreement, means NSC and K can attack. There is nothing holding back. Otherwise, there is an agreement, deal between the two. That you do this, I do this. So if peace, going going ahead with peace, wants that there should be a ceasefire agreement in place. And there should be actively talks on giving up weapons by these such organizations and bringing them onto the negotiation table and finding a solution. Rather than escalating tensions and violence. So, we'll wait and watch what happens. Even another point with respect to Myanmar was that Home Minister had also raised this point and we have discussed this quite often in the last few days that Myanmar border is open. So, free movement along the Myanmar border is allowed. So, there are now steps which are planned to be taken to fence this border. Committee has also been set up by the Home Ministry because they say that this is misused by militants and trans-border criminals. So, we have a 1,643 kilometer unfenced border with Myanmar which is shared between these states of Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Manipur and Mizoram. So, we will see if steps are taken for this also to end this free movement. So, here you can see the Myanmar-India border. So, these are the four northeastern states which share their border with Myanmar. So, this is an important, this map is important, you should know and remember. The next is, Endurance of scorpion to go up. So this also we have discussed quite often. So you see that when you are doing current affairs every day and almost covering them regularly, then it becomes so that many things which are studied for the first time are repeated so many times because there are little updates on them that then they are you know etched into your minds. So then there is no need for a huge amount of burden of revision as such. So regular current affairs reading makes revision also very simple and quick. If you do monthly compilations or if you do only at the end of the year or at the time of the exam, if you try to do current affairs, it will be too cumbersome, too hectic and you will not be able to recollect because there will be all facts, things bombarded on you at that time. So a gradual approach to current affairs is best. So again, scorpion, which we have discussed quite often. So here you can see the first scorpion submarine. You should already know about it, Calvary. It has all, it will be inducted as such. The Navy, it will be inducted into Navy in August 2017. It is presently undergoing trials as such. And we had discussed about this air independent propulsion. So this air independent propulsion module is required to be fitted with the scorpion submarines. And this is not part of scorpion. Scorpion has been acquired from France. So, these six scorpion submarines under Project 75, which have been acquired by France and they have been under making in India. So, they have been built in India at Musgaon Dock Limited. So, this are not having air independent propulsion modules, but this is being manufactured, this is being developed by DRDO. And DRDO is delayed in its development. So, if it would have had been ready, the scorpion manufacturer, DSCN, would have, you know, would have provided for it in the submarine but since it's not ready right now then it cannot be provided for later it had to be fitted in so it cannot be fitted in later so then when it has its you know refit done at that time it would be provided for so the normal refit which happens for a submarine after it's inducted is after six years so six years after induction they would have this air independent propulsion module fitted what is this air independent propulsion module we have already discussed but i'll discuss it once again so, earlier there were also, you should know about Project 75, under which six submarines would come from uh, Scorpi. And the first one, Calvary, is already with us. Five more will come at an interval of nine months. Every nine months, we'll have one submarine coming in. So, that is Project 75. And the Project 75I, which we, have, which we are planning, 
those will be under the strategic partnership model of defense procurement policy so this also should not should ring a bell actually should not be something new for you because that also we have discussed quite quite often in the last few days even last month too we have been discussing it so you should know about all this so yeah so now what is the thing that this air independent propulsion module would be fitted in these present six submarines as well in refit that has been announced what is air, air independent propulsion we had already seen this discussing it once again this will be a this propulsion actually allows submarine to recharge batteries without surfacing without coming up because submarine is underground underwater so if submarines have to come up so then their stealth capabilities are reduced because they will be visible then if they come up as such they will be visible so normally diesel submarines need to come up to acquire you know oxygen and the fuel as such so that the fuel cells here the battery cells can function but if there is an air independent propulsion in place then they could function recharge their batteries without surfacing so that is the benefit they can the endurance increases they can stay underwater for long and their stealth capabilities also increase so this has been indigenously developed by drdo in india then the next news item is us supreme court partially reinstates trump travel ban we'll hear arguments so president donald trump he had famously banned travel of people from six mostly muslim countries as such and this was challenged in the courts as such and the state courts actually had called for this ban to be ineffective but now the supreme court has allowed a limited version of this term travel ban to be effective so the thing is that the full arguments would be heard in october 2017 and the merit of the case would be decided but still the travel ban as such on these uh, nationals from these six nations iran libya somalia sudan syria and yemen so visitors from these would be allowed only if they have credible claim of a bona fide relation with a person or entity in us so this is a provision which is required if a person is coming to usa then you should have a relationship with a person or entity in us so this will be taking into effect and also the other point is that if a person is coming for education purposes then there are specific requirements from them to so those specific requirements like you know relationship should be formal documented formed in ordinary course not for the purpose of evading the travel ban so this is required if you have a formal relationship then only you are allowed to come to work or study so this will be the case here for these six muslim countries so the court has allowed this to be coming into effect and it has also said that further hearing would take place and couple arguments would be heard in october 2017 so the federal appeal courts had blocked and now the supreme court has partially allowed it to come effective again and uh, president donald trump had already announced last week that within 72 hours of it been cleared by the courts it would come into effect if his travel ban would come into effect so this is expected now then the next news item is retailers get gst relief date for tds deferred so gst is coming into effect from 1st of july but then for e tailers online e commerce platforms there are concerns because these e market places which are there they are aggregators so they have other small businesses who use these portals to sell their goods so on them to gst regime would be effective and for them the provisions which are there is of tds tds is tax deduction at source so these are the provisions under central gst and state gst acts you can see so this they have to make deduction tax or deduction at source the e-commerce platform should have this tax deduction done of 1% so this is presently it has been announced so this is for suppliers you know payment of to suppliers for over rupees 2.5 lakh if 2.5 lakh plus payment is being done then 1% tax deduction at source would be done so this is a provision under gst but then it will not come into effect presently this has been announced by the government so this has been deferred in from 1st july gst will become effective but not this provision so some more time is been given for people to adjust for e-commerce sector also to adjust to gst so this is there another provision which is there that there should be mandatory gst registration for small businesses with an annual turnover below rupees 20 lakh who are supplying goods through e-commerce so even if you are 
your turnover is less than 20 lakh but you are supplying goods through e-commerce then they should have a mandatory GST registration this provision has also been put into abeyance it will not come into effect presently so this has been announced by the government then the next news item is feud traps 7000 crore mining taxes so this is regarding mines and minerals development and regulation act of 2015 so this act actually was initiated as an ordinance and then it became an act through the parliament passing it so this date you can see it came into force the provisions came into force from jan 12 2015 but then the rules under this so there's a district mineral foundation or district mineral fund which has to be established so these rules were notified in september 2015 so now the question which is arising is that the actually the miners here this is mines and minerals development so miners here had to pay a royalty on auction mines and also royalty on you know allocated mines so these loyalties had to be paid as such and the rules came later so when since when should these loyalties be paid from jan 12 or september 15 of course the government is asking for payment which effect from jan 12 but then the miners are arguing that it should be effective from September when it was notified. It cannot be from retrospective effect. So this is a case which is going on. The high courts also heard these cases. The high courts have favored the miners and now the Supreme Court is also hearing the matter. So the DMF norms which have been notified in September 2015, they say that miners must pay 10% of royalties on auction mines and 30% of the royalties for mines allotted before the auction regime began so when they had been allotted by the government this much royalty should be paid and all this money which goes into the district mineral fund or district mineral foundation is authority which looks into it so these will be used for the welfare of the miners so there's a scheme which has also been launched by the government in september 2015 for Mantri Kalyan Yojana. so this also is one point which we'll see so another point right now what is mentioned here is that 7000 crore has already been acquired from miners so many potential miners where in case this is to be upheld have already paid also while the case is going on still they have paid so government may have to give refund to them but there are some who have not paid so if all of them pay 7000 crore has been acquired another 7000 crore is possible to be acquired if this comes into effect with this prospective effect and this amount it is highlighting that this is being used for the welfare of the population here like for instance in Jharkhand it is used for drinking water projects so this is there so we'll see at this Pradhan Mantri Khanich Kalyan Yojana too you can see here so this is the ordinance and the act which came into effect as such Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Act so the new act has replaced this 1957 act so under the 1957 act transfer of leases for mines were allowed only if they were acquired through auction and now after amendment transfer of leases are allowed for mines allotted as such too so auction or allotted by government both can transfer of leases is possible so this will help in mergers and acquisitions also then this is regarding the dmf so this dmf has been established in various regions so it's a fund meant for those affected by excavation, mining, blasting and waste disposal. So those people affected by mining will get redress here. So the, you know, it will try to address contamination of water, soil and air quality, reduction in steam flow, depleting groundwater levels, the conditions which the people here suffer from. So these are the provisions here. 80% of mineral riches in India are found in tribal regions. And these regions are having, you know, least of development and they are very having very dense forests so often environmental law violations also take place in this region so that has to be checked into and it says that 70 percent districts with mineral deposits large mineral deposits are backward and half of them are nixal insurgency infected so this is there so this is the Pradhan Mantri Khanich Kalyan Yojana launched for the welfare in this region so same September 2015 it was launched so it will make use of the funds under the district mineral fund to provide for various provisions under this so you know con connectivity roads bridges railways irrigation sanitation education healthcare etc will be provided for under this khanij kshetra means mi mining region kalyan yojana then the next news item is dna used to make nano computers so this is the last news item so you should know what are these dna computing so DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. So it is considered to be having huge amount of potential. 
so the dna as such stores information the genetic information is stored as such so this is being highlighted whether it can be used to store information the way computers memory stores information so this has its initiation here you can see the inventor dr leonard edelman so he talked of a dna computer so it's a molecular level computer so that works biochemically to solve complex problems and different possible solutions are created all at once. So a lot of information and a lot of computing can take place. So it uses enzymes. So they react with the DNA strands and cause a chain reaction and the solutions can come forth. So this is DNA computing. So it stores information and performs complex calculations. So the benefit of DNA computing basically is parallel processing. That parallelly so many different you know, problems can be solved and solutions created all at once. So here the DNA computing advantages are also given. So one, that's what means a test tube of DNA can store trillions of DNA, DNA strands. And these, you know, so all these strands in a test tube, each operation is carried out in parallel. So this is that parallelism is the most important advantage of DNA computing. Gigantic memory capacity it says one gram of DNA can hold 10 raised to 14 megabytes of information. Right. So that is that it's clean, cheap, easily available. It's a bioware. So you know, living cells by itself is converted into a computer powered by its own metabolism. So that is the benefit here. So these are the news items. Thank you.